Today is going to be all about the Prusa Nextruder. Hello everyone, Chris here. The Nextruder is the current generation of filament feeder and hot end setup that Prusa is utilizing on the XL and the Mark IV 3D printers. Now on the XL, it is in a tool head format, so there's a few extra parts, but at the heart of it, it's basically the same thing. My buddy Dave Wilson has an XL and he was having some issues with one of his Nextruder tool heads feeding filament, and he gave it to me to have a look at. So I thought it would be good to make a video about taking apart the Nextruder, taking a look at what it actually does and how it works, and then putting it all back together, hopefully along the way correcting whatever issue that Dave was having. And also, if you have to do any maintenance on your Nextruder, this might give you some insight to what you need to tackle, how you can take it apart without breaking anything, and hopefully get it all back together. So let's jump right into it, we'll take a look at it, what it does, and then we'll move to taking it apart and fixing everything up. Hopefully it'll be as good as new. So here's just an overall look at what the Nextruder is going to look like. This is again in tool head form, this came off an XL. But basically you have the feeder up top here, you have a hot end down here with your heat block and your nozzle. The nozzle actually runs all the way through to the top to the extruder gears up here with a stainless steel tube. So that nozzle is all one piece. Of course your hot end fan to cool it off. This is the dock that goes on the XL so you can load it, you can pick up the tool, put it back down again. We'll go over all of that. Your part fan is over here and your duct. This right here is actually a set of buttons with a status light telling you the status of the tool. But you can actually unload and load an extruder with these buttons. Probably not a lot of people know that. You have your idler door right here. You can see the extruder gear, how it pulls it in. And then back here is a PCB that allows you to plug everything in and then attach a cable here on top to connect everything up to the machine. As we take everything apart, it's going to be pretty self-explanatory. The biggest thing you need to be concerned with in all of this is the gears inside here. It is a planetary setup, there's a couple involved, and they need to be aligned and calibrated correctly. If you open the door here to access the PCB, you can see all the plugs and everything that need to go into this to make it work. These are pretty involved, there's a lot going on here, but you'll see all that as we take it apart and then put it back together. But let's just start with the more common things you might have to do. First off, let's unplug the heater and the thermistor wires from the hot end. That should be these two top ones right here. And then that will allow you to actually swap out the whole heat block and nozzle setup. You can just pull it right out. And of course, before you can pull this out, there is a set screw on the side over here that we're going to back out. That's a T8, and it's important to note there's several different sizes involved here on these tool heads. You could see an M3 hex screw, as well as a T10, T8, or T6 Torx bit. So from the front, via this access hole, there's a set screw in there. We'll just back it out a bit. That will release the tube. It's pressed up against that tube that runs all the way through here, but that's going to allow you to slide it out. Just mind the wires. They ran behind this fan. They'll have to come back. You don't want the plugs getting hooked and pulling anything else out quite yet. So the nozzle's out. We'll talk about installing these a little bit more later, but basically these are hand tight, just a little bit more than that. You never have to torque these down. But we'll set that aside. Next thing I like to do just to get it out of the way, again we're taking this down to pretty much bare bones. I just like to remove this door. It's an M3 hex screw, just one right here that acts as the hinge. I'm just going to back that out and set this off to the side. It just opens it up a bit. The next thing for the average user is to just get used to the idler door right here. This is the idler latch. You just flip it up and then you can open this door and have a look at the extruder gear. This is the outer side of the planetary gear that actually grips the filament, but this is the first place you're going to look if you're having filament loading issues. There might be something stuck in here. The end of that nozzle actually sets right here, just below the gear, so it's directly feeding filament into it. So with the tool head version, the next thing we're going to move to is this docking plate. We can remove that so we can get to some other things here. The two main mounts for this are these torque screws here on the side, and they do have to be really tight. You don't want any movement here, so they might be a little tricky to back out, but when you're putting them back in, make sure they are super snug. 
These are T10s. So that gets the dock loose on this side. The only other thing holding it on is this fan shield over here. This just helps direct the air away from the nozzle portion down underneath. But it's held on via this bottom hot end fan screw. It is an M3 torque. So you can back that out. And there's no need to take this fan deflector off. We'll just pull that screw and then the whole dock will come loose. Now there is a PCB on this dock held in by these two screws here, but we can just unplug it. There's no need to unassemble all this whole part here. It's pretty much all one unit. If you're gonna take something like this apart, please take a picture of it or something. Note where all the wires were before you get everything apart. There are directions out there on how to do this, but make sure that it goes back the same way as you took it apart. All these have specific reasons for being in those slots. So I'm gonna remove this zip tie for now. We'll put it back. But we do plan on taking everything out. Be very careful if you do stuff like this. You don't wanna cut the wires. But since the hot end fan is here on top, we'll just unplug that from this port right here and we'll back out that one torque screw. Again, that is a 10. Then we can set the fan aside. So just moving around, trying to open everything up to show you how it all works. We'll just go to the part fan side here real quick. We've got an M3 screw here on top. And then we have two T10s down here that hold on the part fan duct and the plastic shroud. There's the fan duct. And then the whole fan will lift out. We can swing it around, don't damage the wires. It's plugged in right here. Then that will give you access to the mounting plate here where a lot of these wires are snaked behind. These are three number 10 torques that we can back out. Again, these are three very important screws because they're part of your mounting plate. That's what's gonna keep the tool in place while it's moving, while you're picking it up, putting it back down. All three of these screws are the same length. Two of the standoffs here are going to stay stationary and you wanna make sure those are tight as well, but then one will come with it. So it'll just screw on this center one right here. It acts more as a spacer than really a standoff, but it just sets on there. But we'll set this aside. Now our wires are free for our part fan. One of the features of the next unit you're gonna notice from here is that it has a thermistor here in the heat sink. They take readings from that to be able to notice certain things, like if there's too much heat on the cold side of the nozzle. This can help to detect if the fan's not doing a good job or what might be causing things like heat creeps or jams. I'm not exactly sure how many samples or what they use them for in the firmware, but I know they do compare these to other measurements to try to predict and help failures. And that thermistor for the heatsink is plugged in right here. Now on to the extruder gears. The front cover on your next extruder here Inside here is going to be planetary gears, but the cover for that, they're all M3 hex. You might have seen some of these covers that have a fourth screw down here. They're really no different than the three screw version. It just has a screw that comes forward through the motor this way, rather than through the backside, as you're going to see here in a minute. It's just a different assembly decision. It's probably easier to put together this type than it was the four screw. It really doesn't matter much though. So don't worry that you have an old or new version if you have a four screw one. But we'll just take this cover off and here's where all the magic happens. So basically what we have is a drive gear that's on the end of the motor shaft, this one here in the center, that's driving these two outer gears. These two gears are on shafts as part of the main gear that actually turns the filament. These are all kept by this outer ring. And these have to be aligned just so to make sure they're perfectly in the ring and up against this drive gear at the same time. This screw here is a T6 Torx. You can back that out. That holds your idler door. You'll see the idler door is loose. We can pull that off and set it aside. And now this whole mechanism, including your heatsink, is going to lift off of that stepper motor. We can just lift 
the planetary gear setup and set it aside. We have our heat sink. And some very important parts that we need to talk about here are inside this mount. We have our filament sensor. That's this sensor right here. There's really no need to remove it. We'll take a look at the other side in a second. There's a torque screw here. You can pull it out if you'd like. It plugs in in this hole right here. And then you have the load sensor right in here that the hot end uses to take measurements like a bed leveling sensor would. It touches the nozzle to the bed, uses it for calibration, but there's just a minute amount of flex that this mount would do when that nozzle touches, and this is what senses that. So a very important part, it's in here with some kind of compound. You don't want to remove it, but it does plug in right over here. So now we're free from the main body. We'll take a look at the motor here in a second, but a little bit more on the heat sink side, the actual mounted body here. You have your two idler door springs. This is what sets the tension of the filament up against that extruder gear. I'm gonna back these out. These are M3 hex with some springs on them. Be sure not to lose those springs. The only reason why I'm backing these out is so that I can show you how to install them to make sure that you have the proper tension. So it just holds this idler door on that we looked at before. We'll pull these out and when we go back together we'll take a closer look at that. Remember, I know it's kind of hard to imagine when everything's apart, but your filament path runs right through here and that's how the filament sensor on the extruder side, the tool head side, works. If we take a look in here there's a cartridge inside that you can actually push out. It has a spring in it, be careful. But there's a tiny magnet inside this cartridge that's spring-loaded with a tiny ball on it. So the filament can pass through it, but when it doesn't, it's able to trigger that sensor. It just slides down in that housing. And then on the sensor side, you don't want to touch it with your hands if you can keep from it, but it just has a really small sensor on the end that can sense where that magnet's location is and trigger if the filament isn't present. So just make sure that cartridge is flush on both sides. It will be after you get everything together, but we can just put our sensor back in. So that's what's in the next extruder body. Remember, you do have these standoffs here. That's about the only thing we didn't take apart. They're just screwed in through the back there. And that's the set screw that actually holds the nozzle in. So we'll set this aside. Let's take a look at the motor and the PCB. So the motor actually sits in a metal housing here, but it has another set of wires back inside here that it connects with. It's just a pancake style motor. You can slide it out if you disconnect it. It's a little more obvious if you flip it over and take this cover off. So there's the back of the PCB. And the top section here just slides off the top here. This is what they call the dwarf board. If you flip it over, then you can see the wires that connect the extruder, the motor portion, and then you can just slide that out. A few extra bits down in there, the, the processor, you can see the LED that actually gives you the status that flashes through the front. That's an ARM processor down there. It's an STM32. I think it says G070, just for fun. So a pretty intricate PCB that comes on these all in all. And your extruder motor, it's a pancake style. It is a NEMA 17 but it has a specialized shaft with that spur gear on it to drive that style of extruder. So this goes right in the center to drive those two outer gears for the planetary setup. So you can see just how involved one of these extruders is. There's lots going on in there and you're not gonna wanna disassemble it this far probably, but I just wanted to show you all the components that were involved in case you did have to take something apart. But the tool head form is a little more complicated than it would be on the Mark IV because you have that ability to use the umbilical on the XL to use multiples. But now we're going to go back together and I'm going to give you a little bit more practical way to assemble everything so that it makes sense if you have to take it apart just for maintenance purposes. So let's start back together here with the body. So the first thing you do is make sure all the filament sensor parts are all back together. We just took a look at that. If you're doing maintenance, remove the Bowden coupler and make sure there's nothing obstructing your filament path down through here. Maybe some canned air. Just make sure it's cleaned out and that that filament sensor is working properly. Use a piece of filament to go through there. Just make sure it's clear. 
This one looks good, so I'll put my coupler back on. And then we'll take a look at our motor again real quick. Make sure that there is a spacer on your motor. These are actually pretty hard to see and you might not know they're there. But this spacer is necessary for everything to work correctly. It just sets down on here, but you don't want to accidentally lose it or go without it. So make sure that's on the motor shaft. And then since we have the tool head version, we can go ahead and put our motor back in our housing. Cable goes in first. Watch the components on that board. You don't want to scrape anything. And we can go ahead and plug it back in. You don't want to get this all the way together and forget about that. So our motor's in place. Everything on the extruder portion is built on top of this as a platform. So we want to make sure that's set first. Now with our extruder gear housing, you're going to have a printed plate here on the back. We need to make sure that's in the correct orientation. But here's the planetary gear setup. You can see there's some filament ground in there. This is the portion that actually grips the filament. And you can just lift it out of this ring. It's a pretty precise fit, but you can lift it off. And here's the planetary gear setup. Now this whole thing is assembled with shafts and snap rings. You can take it apart, but I don't recommend it. If you don't have a problem with one of these gears, if everything's turning freely, everything looks good, just leave it as is. But this is what it looks like. And then there's a 3D printed part you can print out over on the site that helps you put all this back together and keep it lined up. And that's this part right here. You can see how these gears will line up on the printed part into these openings. And this just makes it a lot easier to line it up with a PG ring as well as the motor shaft. Now you have to be careful with the PG ring because there's only one way it really needs to go on. And it's going to be really hard to see, but one side of this is completely flat around those teeth. The other side has a chamfer. Hopefully you can see that. That's going to be important. The chamfered side of this gear needs to be facing down when you're building. So your assembly here will go inside to the flat side to the chamfer side. And then once that's on, you can just set this whole thing aside, but that will help you keep the chamfer side in the orientation that it needs to go on. And then to install it, your heat sink section will go on just like this. Then you'll have your printed section, the shroud that helps guide, and it has a cutout. Remember that's for the idler door we saw when we took that apart. There's a set screw that goes through there. It sets on just like this. And then remember we have our chamfer side loaded down. So it goes down into the assembly. You can spin this printed part just a bit to help guide it onto that motor shaft. When it's flush, you can go ahead and remove the printed part. Now all the gears are lined up as they should be. Make sure they're all seated correctly. You'll know when everything's together as it should because we're flush on this side. You can take a look at it, what it looks like on this side. That's a good alignment of those gears. Always double and triple check though that the planetary gears here are below the ring or at least at it. It can't stick up above that ring at all and that these can turn really freely. And like I just showed you around the outside, there are no gaps. So once that's in place, you can go ahead and put your idler door on to start holding this down to the assembly. Now on the idler door, you'll notice there are some bearings in here. There's just a couple of shafts. The whole thing's held together by an M3 screw. Make sure these are nice and clean and they're turning freely, which these are, but you might notice a part that this one doesn't have. And that is the spacer that goes in between this printed part. This is what the door actually hinges on, and this next reader doesn't have one. So we're missing a metal piece that goes in here. That's what was keeping the filament from extruding correctly. It couldn't grip it tight enough because it was slopping around inside this shaft. So remember our set screw? This is too small to actually hold that door in place. You need a bit of help. So we need to find a part to fix that. It just so happens I have a spare. These are about 12 millimeters long, but they just fit down in the idler door, providing a little more mass for that to hinge so that that set screw 
can go through, hold the door in place, and then this set screw just screws into the motor on the other side. There's no need for it to be super tight, but it does keep everything lined up. Now it's on, the door's in place, and this should work a lot better going forward. And you should get some grease with your Prusa kit. Now is a great time to put some on. You need just a little bit inside here to keep everything moving correctly. I like to use these foam style Q-tips. Just put a little grease on it. And I just put some on both internal gears, a little on both sides, whatever you can get to. You don't have to get carried away. And then a little bit on the outside ring, just in various spots. It'll pick all this up as it spins. But while you have it open, it's good to go ahead and lubricate it. Since it's been lubricated before, this is more than enough. Then you can go ahead and put that outer cover on to keep everything safe. We're done with this assembly and this will further line it up. Do make sure that it has the plastic ring installed. That's going to set on top of those planetary gears, let them turn freely, but also keep them in place. It should already be there, but might as well double check while you're in there. So if that's in place, just set the cover back on here and we can tighten up our screws. As you're tightening these, do it in equal amounts around the cover. Maybe go crosswise. There's no need to get crazy tight with them, but make sure everything is lining up successfully. Give it a push here and there to make sure everything's flush. You don't want any gaps. Just tighten them snug. It's not going anywhere. And everything for the extruder gears are assembled. Next, we'll put our door back on. It's just a couple of printed parts, but make sure you have your metal spacer in here. This is what hooks and closes the door firmly. And you've got your torque screws and lock nuts installed. Your spring-loaded idler door screws are gonna go through the back of the housing. You can hold those in place. We'll just leave that door open. And the heads of the screws will go towards the front of the extruder. There are two dots on the door mount on the printed part make sure those two dots are up. So going this way on the extruder. And again, those two screws are supposed to be facing out. So you wanna make sure the door is attached just like this. I'll show you one more time. And we'll start threading those screws in from the back. It is just a printed part. It'll mount almost flush with the metal mount for the heat sink here. There's still a little bit of gap, but the screws just go in flush with this printed part. You don't want to get them too tight. So right as you start to see the end of that screw, that's tight enough. And we'll match it, make sure they're both even. They need to both have the same tension. So there you go, that's about perfect. You can open that up, close the door, put your latch on, there should be just a little bit of tension there pulling on those screws when you flip that over. That's how you know you have it assembled correctly. So now that a lot of the important parts are assembled, we can go ahead and put some of the shrouds back on. We'll slide on the top cover. It just fits down over the PCB. And then we can put the back cover on. It actually holds that top shroud in place. It just kind of hooks around the bottom of the PCB and slides up. Then you can put those screws back in to hold the cover on. Now that that cover's back on, I'm gonna go ahead and plug in a few things. Our load sensor, again, it goes right here. And then the gray one here that I'm showing is the filament sensor. It goes right here. And then the thermistor for your heat sink goes up here in the corner. So then we'll go back to the other side and we wanna make sure when we're running these wires that they're in the correct spot. I like to try to put them above this standoff. Don't get carried away. You don't wanna pinch them. You don't want them even close to where that mount is gonna meet up. But the more wires you can get out of the flow of air here, the better. 
This one, remember, is going to go on to the front of that dock. That's where that dock plate plugs in. And you have one more wire you need to be concerned about. It has to run over here to this side to that PCB to plug in, and that's your part cooling fan. So your part fan will set just like this after that mount's on. I just like to put the wires in before I put my mount on because, again, I'm going to run them above that standoff. And then your dock mounting plate can go back on. Remember, we've got two loose torque screws there, and then it has a standoff on it as kind of a spacer. Make sure that is super tight. As well as these standoffs down here, make sure those are tight. And we're going to make sure these screws going on the top are nice and tight. And I say that multiple times because that can cause print issues. If you're seeing print artifacts, that might be the cause. Some of these standoffs aren't tight enough. Go in there and inspect those. But we'll just tighten those down. And I'm going to check a couple of times to make sure those are nice and snug. Same way with the front dock screws that we're going to do here in a moment. So the plate's on, your part fan will swing over. Remember you have your shroud. Just put that on, line that up. You have your top hex screw. It'll go on that plate. And then your fan shroud screws. Then we'll spin it back over again. We can plug in our part fan. Part fan's going to go in fan one port up here, right there. And then you can go ahead and put on your hot end fan. It just has the one screw there in front, and then it has a shroud that holds the other quarter on. So it goes just like this, and it plugs in to that center one here on the outside, right there. I like to leave that just a little bit loose, because then we're going to put on our dock. The dock just sits on here like this, but it does help line that fan up a bit. That's why I leave it loose. So that deflector will fit on there. We'll get it started. And then we can go ahead and tighten up that hot end fan screw. And then finish tightening the deflector screw. And then we flip it over. We can plug in our dock wires and then put our two dock screws back in. Again, these two are also very important. You need to make sure that these are nice and snug. If not, you can see up and down movement on your tool head. You can imagine what kind of artifacts that would cause. So we're going to make sure those are nice and snug. And we're almost done. So really the only other parts, we have to put our door back on. And then we'll talk about the nozzle and heat block a little bit more. Doors on. And since all these wires in here currently, you don't really have to remove them to swap nozzles or anything. They're going to stay in place for the most part. Feel free to go ahead and zip tie these up just to keep them nice and neat. And then we can talk about the nozzle. Now, one thing you never want to do is put too much force on one of these nozzles. Now, they give you some wrenches to use to tighten these up. And they're not the greatest wrenches, but they definitely don't allow you to put too much torque on these. But if you just have a 13 millimeter wrench, that will fit your heat block. And then a seven millimeter socket will back out the nozzle. Now, this is my torque tool from the Olsen Ruby back in the day. It is 1.5 Newton meters or 13.3 pounds, inch pounds of torque. So this is the perfect amount for tightening up one of these nozzles. You never want any more than that. But you should be able to back it out easily even if it has some filament on it, and we'll just inspect it. This actually looks like a really clean nozzle, like it doesn't have a whole lot of use. Now you could try to heat these up inside here. I don't really recommend it. I haven't had one get too stuck, but it's probably just best to replace them if you're that bad off, if you think it's jammed. The only alternative I would suggest would be a cold pull. You can look that up. I like to use nylon filament, cool it down, and then try to pull it out to get any debris out of here. It will remove it with the filament. There's lots of videos on that. But inspect it, make sure everything's good. You can usually clear most jams while it's in the printer if you have to. But this looks like it's in good shape, so I'm just going to put it right back in. Just hand tight. 
and we'll use our torque tool and that is more than enough force. So we should be good. We can thread our wires back behind that front standoff. When you have all those wires like I showed you before behind that top standoff it makes it a lot easier to deal with these wires. Once you get those partially in just start that nozzle into the heat sink and then you can kind of push that, heat, that nozzle into the heat sink as you guide the wires back. That copper brake piece that you see right here should be flush with this heat sink. That's as far as it needs to go, right there. And you want to lean that heat block back a bit towards the part fan just so there's a clear shot at the wires as possible. You don't want to tweak these any or disrupt them because that might cause a break and then it won't work any longer. So somewhere right in that neighborhood. Then once again, you can use your T8 from the front. Put that set screw there. It doesn't have to be very tight. You don't want to have to pinch that nozzle any more than you have to, just to keep it from spinning in place. And then we can plug it back in. Heater right up here. And then thermistor right down from that. And you can close up shop. So the next router is good. The only thing that I would tell you is you want to make sure that you have some lubricant on these alignment pins here. Now these fit into the dock on your XL. So it grabs it, it has couplers right here that are somewhat spring loaded, and this keeps them seated and make sure that the nozzle, the tool head, is parallel with the bed at all times in the same spot every time you grab it. But what can happen is anything that might be a burr or inconsistency on those two parts could make it tilt in place just a little bit one way or another. The easiest way to prevent that is to just get your lubricant that came with your kit and put just a little bit on each one of these. We'll use that same foam Q-tip to spread it around. And this will ensure every time it grabs it, it will slide into the correct place, its absolute position, and you won't have any problems at all. This probably isn't even necessary to a well-calibrated machine, but it's not going to hurt anything, and it's going to keep you from having any issues. So there you go. This is ready to go back on the XL. So there we go. We found an issue with the next extruder. We have corrected it and we should be ready to go back on the machine. And that's one really nice part for me having an XL. If one of my friends has one like Dave here, I can just take that tool head off of his, swap it right on mine in a matter of minutes and test it out. So let's go do that. So I'm at my XL. I already removed my tool head, but really the only screws that are involved here are the ones for your wire strain relief. They go on the front. You can just slip those back on. No need to get too crazy with tightening them down. Then you can put your PTFE tube back in. And then your wire loom with your printed part just slips right back down onto the tool head. We'll even show you how it goes right like that. And then you're ready to just go ahead and set it back on the dock. Of course, I would power down the machine. And if you're going to do this, I suggest you use one of the two through five tool heads. The XL is calibrated from the first head. So remember that the calibration sequence or the before print sequence is going to take care of all of those numbers. If you have to swap out a lot of tool heads, do the recalibrate, but it's probably not necessary if you just use these four. So now we can go ahead and power up the XL, make sure that it's okay with that new tool, which it should be, and then we can run a test print. The XL powered up. It didn't have any issues with that tool head. You can see all the lights are green flashing. They're ready to go. So we'll go ahead and preheat for PLA, and we'll tell it to load filament in tool 5. It grabbed it off the dock, no problem at all. Uh, 
make sure that you don't have any loose connections here or it's not seated correctly in the dock. This is nice and firm. That means we have everything together correctly. We're still heating up. We'll load in some very affordable blue filament. Once it gets down to the filament sensor, make sure that it triggers and it's ready to bring it in. Mine says continue, so I'll just hit the button. I can feel it pulling on the filament. That's a good sign. It's bringing the filament in. You can see it's kicking it out. It's not complaining about the binding or anything, so that means the extruder is turning freely. It's successfully loaded, and I just flashed a quick print over here so we can test it out. The biggest thing you want to make sure with the test print is that it's able to kick out filament on the first layer and then when it speeds up to the second layer because those are different. Especially with the input shaper, you want to make sure that it's extruding enough to handle the speed. That gives you a good idea if the ex extruder is installed correctly and it's gripping the filament well enough. Load sensor is working. It's able to stop the bed. That's another good sign. We've docked and undocked again. We've got the fifth tool head. We've leveled. We've already done our pre-extrusion and we're off and printing. So all very good signs. Remember again, if you're testing this, you want to make sure you let the first layer go down. And if that's good, watch it through the second layer, even more than that, because they're going to be much faster and able to kick out more plastic. So that's going to be a good indication if your extruder is skipping. First layer is done, we're off and rolling on the second layer. It is flying through the filament. It is a 0.6 nozzle, but it's having no problems laying that filament down. We'll check from the other side. The layers are looking really good. I think our repair is complete. We have saved this next extruder from whatever issues it might have been having. So there we go. Our next extruder repair is now complete and it's back in working order. Now with this one, we did find a missing part that was causing the issue, but hopefully this is helpful for anyone that's doing maintenance on their next extruder or they need to make any kind of repair. This should give you some guidance on what to take apart and how it goes back together. Do mind those extruder gears. They have to go on a certain way. They're very precise. Utilize that printed part. There will be a lot more information in the description below. So. Hopefully you found this helpful. That's it for today, and I'll see you really soon on the next one.